Well, good morning, everyone. If you want to find the little <laughs> book for the prophet Joel, we completed Hosea last week, and now we're going to take a few weeks and look at the uh, book of Joel. And uh, got some introductory material, and we'll spend some time with this looking at the subject, uh, you know, the day of the Lord. You know, is one of the, I guess you might say, the major theme in the book of Joel, and and of course it's mentioned by some of the other prophets, but uh, we'll take time in looking at that particular subject some here, here in the introduction of this book, and um, it's not a long book, and so won't take hopefully too long to work through it and um, we believe it's all important uh, to us even today and what we can glean from it so let's let's look to God in prayer father how grateful we are to be here this morning Lord you bless us so richly and you've been so good to us and so we want to just thank and praise you for all that right from the start and thank you for your son the Lord Jesus and what he's done on our behalf and what's yet to come because of the grace given to us through him and Father, in particular in light of when we get to studying the book of Joel and, and the others uh, makes us just even more grateful Lord for what we have in Christ and Father what we can can look forward to and Lord help us to be people of, of the hope of God and, and to uh, live for Christ in these days which you placed us and uh, help us Lord to be faithful and, and uh, discerning and mindful of you Lord and particular in light of all the other things that are going on about us in this country and Lord that you just keep our minds and hearts quietened and focused on the fact that you are God and that Lord you are in control and that you are working out your plan for things and Father we see some of that in, in this book here and and so Lord help us to grow in our understanding of you and, and how uh, you desire to have things done here in this world of yours we uh, Thank you again for all things. I ask you to bless in the services here today. May your spirit be present and at work in a great way. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, we won't uh, look at anything particular as far as out of the book itself. We'll just start with the introductory and just general information. Uh, the name Joel means Yahweh is Elohim. Uh, or Jehovah is God. That's, you know, the combine the two uh, syllables of, of, the, of the name, and, and there you have it. Elijah is just the opposite. Elijah is God is Jehovah, or, or Elohim is uh, Yahweh. And so uh, there you have an understanding where the, where the name come from. They don't make me very, I mean, there's nothing special about me. You know, I didn't have much choice in what name I was given to me, so... <laughs> <laughs> it's just what was what was given to me. Actually, named after a, a great grandfather, and uh, from many years back. However, the name was fairly common among the ancient Israelites, and I guess it would be. And thinking about what it means, and if you read through the Old Testament, there are several other men mentioned in the Old Testament with the name Joel, and I've given you those uh, scripture references. So if you are a trivia nut and you want to <laughs> know where those things are, there they are, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, from various ages in the Old Testament. The thing that really makes uh, or gets after scholars sometimes is the fact that nothing is known about Joel other than his father's name, which is uh, Bethuel. And, and so nothing much else known about him. And so they've worked hard, scholars have, to try to mine out, I guess, information from the book regarding who he is and at what time he ministered and so forth and so on. And really, when he gets right down to it, maybe those things aren't what God had in mind as being as important. You know, it helps to understand the time frame for things and understand the, you know, what's going on. You know, so it maybe helps you understand better what the, the author is writing about and why. And some of that can be gathered from the book, but um, a lot of this other information is, is uh, really unknown, and, and you can't be real dogmatic about it. You know, uh, as we'll get into this, we'll see that scholars are kind of divided up in two camps regarding what they believe about Joel and the time frame that he ministered. Uh, the same thing is about his father's name, which means enlarged of or open towards God. So both these names are good names, uh, spiritually speaking. 
and and um, but nothing else is known about his father and so you know a lot of a lot of I should say mystery there about the two Bible scholars have tried to deduce from the study of Joel's prophecy information that would provide some insight into the prophet. It is believed that he was a Judean who lived in or near the city of Jerusalem. He was familiar with the activities associated with the temple, while at the same time he had knowledge regarding agriculture. And so, you know, there were some scholars that believed he was you know, maybe a, a priest or part of the, you know, the Levites, but others kind of kind of put that you know down and said no, he wasn't. And uh, you know, there's page after page after page after page written about these arguments, and and you know it's I guess interesting reading, but it's not something that I don't think we need to delve into here. You know, it's just beyond the, the scope of what we want to do. And um, so some of these things are just summaries from what what I've read. It's from the temple area that he requests the priests to sound the trumpets to call the people to a solemn assembly. And you know, later on here in the first chapter and on into the second chapter. So he does have some knowledge about what goes on and apparently does have some contact with those serving in the temple. He refers to the people as the children of Zion there in the second chapter. And of course the word Zion is used to reference the city of, of Jerusalem or to the actual Temple Mount area or maybe to that region as a whole, but most often to the city of Jerusalem itself. And he refers to them as the children of Judah and Jerusalem there in chapter 3. So that's why they think maybe he is you know, from Judah. He makes no direct reference to the northern ten tribes. You know, we studied Hosea, and we knew that was his primary ministry to the northern ten tribes, even though he did have some things to say to Judah. But uh, we don't see much about that here in the book of Joel. When the name Israel is first mentioned there in chapter 227 it is in reference to Judah and God's coming deliverance from the drought and from the plague of locusts as they were experiencing. I think also there it can mean reference to uh, Israel as a whole looking out into the future at that point. I think there's you know, a double meaning there in what is said there. Later on in chapter 3 it's, the word Israel is mentioned twice and uh, there it's believed it's in reference to the 12 twi tribes as a whole. And it's the time that Jesus comes to judge the nations and Israel and establish his kingdom on the earth. In fact, we'll just read one of those and you'll see why. There in chapter 3, verse 2, says, uh, speaking to the Lord, says, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they've scattered among the nations and parted my land. So we see, though, know, from that particular verse, that's something that lies out in the future, and that Israel there is referred to, you know, all the tribes as a, as a group. And uh, so, uh, and I give you the references there, Matthew 25, the verses there, it talks about the Lord, and you're probably familiar with that, separating the sheep and the goats. And that's the time that he, when he returns to earth, and right prior to the millennial kingdom, where he judges people and and those that that are believers and have gone through the tribulation as as believers, and they've uh, you know taken care of the Israelites, so to speak, and that type of thing. You know they'll get to enter into the millennial kingdom. The others that are will be sent the other way into eternity, separated from God. And then Ezekiel 20 is where we see that same time frame, the judgment of the, of the Jews at that time. And, and um, those who, Jews who were rebellious and then those who were righteous. And so I've given you those to, to look up and read. There are no direct references to any event or person to prophecy that would point to a certain period of time that Joel ministered. And that's what kind of makes you know, timing it so, so difficult. Therefore, in trying to establish a time frame for the prophecy, scholars have depended on what may be learned from the internal information. However, their studies have resulted in many different dates being set for prophecy, and they are, they're all over the place, you know, with what they believe the date would be. And um, the position of Joel within the 12, 12 and remember we said the term 12 refers to, you know, the minor prophets, uh, and here being the second one in, in the group, implies an early date among the minor prophets, although such method of dating cannot be upheld dogmatically. You know, it is believed by a lot of scholars that the minor prophets are kind of grouped by the order of the age at which they were, were written or the prophecy given. 
and uh, you know those that were given prior to the exile uh, Israel and, and Judea be taken into exile than those who were wrote or ministered after or during that exile the fact that there was a temple in place and sacrifices being offered on a regular basis, except for the shortages of the offerings caused by the locust plague, rules out the period from 586 B.C. to 515 B.C. for the prophecy. You know, this was a period of time from when the Babylonians destroyed Solomon's temple to the time when the construction of the second temple was, was complete. And so from reading Joel, we know that there was a temple there and that you know, the sacrifices were being made or, or being made when there was something to be made with. And so it rules out the period of exile. And, and so primarily scholars are divided up between those who believe it was written pre-exile are those who were believe it was written post-exile and there are various reasons for doing so there is one thing that is a possible link between Joel's prophecy and Amos's prophecy regarding a plague of locusts you know if you uh, get over to Amos in chapter 7 and um, the first three verses says thus hath the Lord God showed unto me and behold he formed grasshoppers in the beginning of the shooting up of the latter growth and lo it was the latter growth after the king's mowings and it came to pass when he had made an end of the eating the grass of the land when I said O Lord God forgive I beseech thee by whom shall Jacob arise for he is small the Lord repented for this and it shall not be saith the Lord you know, here again, can't say absolutely or not, but some scholars have seen a kind of a link there between, you know, the two prophecies. And um, we do know that uh, <clears throat> Amos is reference to some plague that would make Joel a contemporary of Amos, who prophesied during the reign of King Uzziah in Judah and King Jeroboam II. And there's a the time frame for their reigns. Um, it's believed that Amos' ministry was probably between 760 and 755 B.C. In other words, towards the end of both of those kings' reigns. And so if the link is real, <laughs> then Joel might have written somewhere in that same, same time frame. And so just hold the word if there. <laughs> and... Uh, now the circumstances that were present when Joel issued his prophecy were troublesome for Judah and Jerusalem. There was a severe drought present at the same time that a massive plague of locusts had invaded the land. <clears throat> and we'll look at that when we go through the first chapter. You know, the presence of those two conditions likely resulted in an economic downturn for the nations. You know, when you know, they were very much an agrarian people. You know, they depended on, you know, the crops they grew and their livestock for, for life and for any type of financial means by which they could trade with other people, other nations. And so if their source of, of revenue is cut off, then, you know, they don't have the ability uh, to, you know, to carry on, you know, what's needed, get what's needed often. The livestock had nothing to eat, you see there in chapter 1. There was nothing available for the offerings to be made to the Lord. And so all those things were going on. Things had gotten so bad that the locusts had eaten the bark off the fig trees. It was pretty bad when the leaves were gone and the bugs themselves were gnawing on the bark. You know it's uh, pretty getting pretty sparse. The drought created conditions conductive to the outbreak of wildfires. And uh, you know, we don't have we have that around here some. You know, it gets dry at periods of time, and you know, there's always put out the weather warnings. You know, do not have open fires and so forth and so on. And you know, out west where it really gets to be a problem, where it gets dry, and you know, the heat and the drought makes it a whole lot more likely for a fire to break out. And so maybe there had been some fires from due to the drought. Economic weakness often resulted in military weakness. <clears throat> you know, if the foot soldier didn't have nothing to eat, then he wasn't very, couldn't get along very well in battle. And uh, so all those things at that time, you know, weren't faring too well. In addition, the country had been attacked by enemies such as Philistia and Sidon and Tyre. We see that in chapter 3. And... Uh, you know, the prophet Amos pronounced judgment against Philistia and Tyre, along with others, for their treatment of the Israelites. So here again, there's another, maybe another little link there. And so all these things were going on. The country is going through a difficult time. 
you know, there have been some scholars who linked it to the uh, drought that took place during Elijah's ministry. And, you know, others have said, no, it's not because of this and this. But, you know, here again, it's a lot of, lot of supposition and a lot of, a lot of studies gone into it. I know that. And unlike many other prophets God sent to Israel and Judah, Joel did not admonish the Israelites from being involved with idolatry. And very much like in uh, you know, Hosea. Hosea, you know, was all over the Israelites for their idolatry. He does not address any specific sins that the people were guilty of committing. However, he does call them to be genuinely repentant before God, which implies that the nation as a whole was not serving and worshiping God as they've been commanded to do. We see that over in chapter 2. Then I wrote in here 2 Kings uh, chapter 15, 3 and 4. <clears throat> And with Judah, what often happened, you would have a, uh, a king who was, was godly. You know, he was doing, the Bible says he was doing what right in the sight of the Lord. But at the same time, the people themselves would still be involved with going up into what they call the high places and offering sacrifices and incense in places that were not, uh, you know, sanctioned by God and not approved by God. And, and that's what was going on during Uzziah's reign. You know, Uzziah, until he messed up by going into the temple and doing things he shouldn't, you know, Uzziah was a, was a godly king. And God blessed uh, Judah under his reign. But the people were involved in things they shouldn't. <clears throat> and so there may have been conditions like this that, that Joel was addressing in, in, a, in a general way. The fact that, um, you know, trying to put out a general, I guess you say, admonition regarding uh, their departure from the Lord and the things they shouldn't be doing. Now, the only king mentioned is Jehoshaphat, whose name is used in reference to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And the word Jehoshaphat means Yahweh or Jehovah has judged. And uh, there and over in chapter 3, in fact, the, the verse we read a minute ago. And uh, we'll look at that term some when we get over there to it and what it, what it may mean. King Jehoshaphat reigned from 783 to 748 B.C. And so this does put a limit on Joel's prophecy to some point during or after his reign. And so we have a, now can kind of step and say, well, it was from this point of time, you know, going forward, you might say. You know, prior to that, Jehoshaphat would have been an unknown entity. And the, the reference to him wouldn't have been made any sense to anybody. And particularly the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And uh, um, so... We'll talk about that a little bit when we get there. Due to the difficulties experienced with foreign nations, the political leadership did not provide the strength and stability that was enjoyed during some of the reigns of the, some of the kings, such as David, Solomon, Jehoshaphat, and Uzziah. Really, particularly the beginning of Uzziah's reign. You know, towards the end, I think there was maybe some trouble. Very little information is provided by Joel that would allow a dogmatic time to be set for the prophecy. <laughs> So I think because of that, I think what God would have us to get from that is, is you know, other things and, and to learn other things from the study of the book. Now, the primary theme of Joel's prophecy is the day of the Lord or the day of Yahweh. The phrase is mentioned five times in the book. This same theme is present in several other Old Testament prophecies. And uh, besides Joel, the phrase is used by seven other Old Testament writers for a total of 14 times. And we see Isaiah referring to it and Ezekiel referring to it. We see Amos and Obadiah and Zephaniah and Zechariah and Malachi. So a lot of the other Old Testament prophecies referred to this particular phrase. And um, so it was, it was an important thing. And that's what we, you know, we're going to spend a little time looking at it this morning. In both the Old and New Testaments, there are other phrases that use, that often have a relationship to the day of the Lord, and such as that day, or those days, or that time, or the day of trouble, or great and terrible day, and last days. You know, with these phrases, you know, there's often a link to the, to the idea of the day of the Lord. And, uh, and if you can get to reading around, and, and you'll see that. Since there is a large number of related terms and passages in Scripture, it has been difficult for Bible scholars to come to a consensus about all the characteristics of this period of time. The day of the Lord can be defined as follows. And here's a quote from Ronald Allen. 
says the day of Yahweh is that period of time when the Lord dramatically and profoundly and intimately intervenes in the affairs of men either for wrath or for restoration and blessing and so you know God is always involved in what's going on in this world you know there were a group of people I think what they call deists that believe that it's kind of like a clock God wound that thing up and set it in motion and he just sat back and, and just watch it ticking you know, till it spring, till the spring unwinds, I guess. Or till something breaks. But God's not like that. You know, uh, Colossians talks about, you know, things consist by the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, if, if God wasn't involved in, in all that's going on in this world, it would collapse. It would come to a, a screeching halt in a big time, in a bad way. And uh, so God is at work, and God is involved. Uh, he's involved in each of our lives. Uh, you know, he cares about me. He cares about each of you uh, personally, intimately, every day, all the time. And and no matter what's going on, he's he's aware and, and uh, has knowledge of it. And same way, everything else that goes on, you know, in this world, and I think beyond the world. You know, when two stars run together out in space and there's a big boom, you know, you know, God, that's part of God's plan. And, and uh, you know, when the asteroid hits the moon, you know, that's not something unknown to God or, or that wasn't planned by Him. And so, you know, God is totally sovereign and He's totally in control and He's uh, intimately involved and all that goes on. But the day of the Lord is a time where He you might say supernaturally on occasion and very much gets involved in, in the affairs of this world. And whether it's on the, the level of an individual country such as Israel or, or to the, we'll see the world as a whole, uh, you get to looking at the, the final day of the Lord. And, and, you know, he's dealing with this whole world. And sometimes I almost think that sometimes it comes down to an individual's, you know, <laughs> You know, talk about the day of salvation for a person. That might be, in one regard, uh, an individual's a little day of the Lord, <laughs> and uh, where God is dealing with one, you, you or me or somebody in particular uh, about some issue or some important thing in your life. And so, uh, all that is, you know, some of it's mysterious to us, and and it's probably better off with that it is. And we just need to trust that God's in control and, and involved and, and aware of all that's going on. It says the word day has a variety of meanings in the Bible. In addition to referring to a 24-hour period of time, you, know, you take the seven days of creation. I believe those are seven 24-hour periods of time. And, and um, it's also used to refer to an indefinite period of time. And we see that in the use of such as the day of his or God's wrath there in Job, or the day of trouble in Psalm 21. The day of the Lord of hosts, Isaiah 2.12. So, you know, it sometimes refers to just the, the day itself, you know, what we think of a day. And, and other times it refers to a, a, an indefinite period of time. You know, it might be a week, it might be a month, it might be a year, it might be whatever. And, um, you know, those parameters are not necessarily always set. When used in this manner, the word day is not accompanied by a definite article. You know, you know in the Greek language and Hebrew language, there's what's called a definite article. and places emphasis on a particular term. And so, in these cases, there's not a def definite article. Therefore, the phrase does not refer to a definite period of time, but to a definite event or happening taking place within time. So you understand the difference? You know, it's not the period of time that's the focus, it's the event that's taking place within time that's the focus in this case. <clears throat> the emphasis is on the qualities or characteristics present within that period of time rather than on the quantity or the length or the period of time itself. And so with the day of the Lord, the, the focus is on what is taking place within that period of time. You know, it's not how long that is or the stop or the starting point. You know, we can believe about the final day of the Lord. We kind of have a what we believe a start and end date is. But uh, a lot of these other situations we don't have or cannot determine what that uh, parameter or that length of time would be. The nature of the day of the Lord is determined by its association with the personal name for God. You know, I think this is important. Um, 
it is the Lord's day or it is Jehovah's day or it is Yahweh's day it belongs to him not only does he possess infinite power and might but he's intimately involved in human affairs and so as we said earlier you know the infinite God is is stepping into the finite realm of this world because it is the day of the Lord or Yahweh this period of time will have special significance for or for Israel, the nation of Israel, due to the name's covenant uh, significance with the nation. In other words, who was the name Yahweh given to if initially? It was, was to, to the Jews. It's, and that's why it's important regarding Israel. And, you know, you even hear some Bible scholars talking about Israel being God's timepiece, you know, for, for this world. And, and um, you know, the Bible, of course, centers around Jesus Christ, but it also has a lot of involvement with the nation of Israel and, and what's going on with Israel. And, and, you know, the other countries that are mentioned in the Bible generally are those countries because they interact with, have interacted with Israel. And, and you know, you get the Old Testament, you, know, you don't see any reference to China or to, or to Japan or, or to some of those nations because Mexico or Brazil, because... No, they didn't have any involvement with Israel, or, and for whatever reason, you know, God planned it that way. And but uh, the countries that had involvement with Israel, or that were prophesied to have some involvement with Israel, you know, they were mentioned there. And uh, so uh, that's how all that I think comes about. Um, <coughs> Other nations are involved due to their having some form of involvement with Israel or their particular interaction with the Lord. You know, um, people ask about the United States, and, you know, I think it's in Zechariah, talks about all nations coming up against Israel there in the very end. You know, think there's, you know, if the United States is around at that point, you know, there will be. And uh, unfortunately, we won't be on the right side. And, uh, says the phrase day of the Lord should not be confused with the phrase day of Jesus Christ. You know, it's found in the New Testament, which has special significance for the church. It's always important that we keep Israel and the church separate. They're two different programs in God's mind. And even though there are Jews who are in the church and, and part of the church, you know, you must keep God's program for Israel and God's program for the church separate. And um, the day of Jesus Christ is a reference to the time that the Lord returns for His church and raptures it out of the world and completes His preparation and glorification for eternity with Him. And so uh, that's what that day of Christ should mean to us when we read about it in the New Testament. And uh, actually, you know, the, the day of Christ will be uh, take place right before what I believe the, the final day of the Lord, you know, is beginning. And uh, prophecies regarding the day of the Lord are directed at Israel or Judah in the majority of instances. When used otherwise, it refers to Gentile nations in general, such as in found in Isaiah 13, 6, 9, and Joel 3, 14 where it says, Multitudes and multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. And the word valley of decision there is the same as the valley of Jehoshaphat. And so we will look at that when we get to that point. And uh, in fact, those verse there is a reference to what we see over in Matthew 25. You, you, that's where those link together. And... Uh, it says, Old Testament prophecies, prophets... And uh, I'm whoops, I left out of one here. Obadiah 115. Uh, the day of the Lord is used regarding Edom in particular and the Gentile nations as a whole. So when we get to studying e uh, Obadiah, we'll, we'll look at that. Several, the Bible gives several characteristics regarding the day of the Lord. It says the Old Testament prophets often look forward to the coming of the day of the Lord. We see that in Hosea, I mean Isaiah 13, 9, and here again in Joel 2, 1. And it says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. So Joel was saying, you know, the day of the Lord is, is right around the horizon, you might say. It's, um, it's near. And so he was looking forward to his coming. In many instances, it's described as being imminent, like just what we just read. 
by using such phrases as at hand or nigh at hand or is near. And I've listed some of those references there for you. It's also described as a day which is coming from Isaiah and then here in Joel. Zephaniah speaks of it as hasting greatly. You know, it's coming with great haste. In other words, it's, the feet are not dragging. They're on the run. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's on its way and in a hurry. From the perspective of the Old Testament prophets, the phrase day of the Lord was used to describe events which would be fulfilled shortly after the prophecy was given. It would be during these events that God would intervene in a direct way in human affairs. And uh, from Ezekiel 13, 13 through 23, uh, when you read that one, you see that is a reference to the judgment on Judah and Jerusalem and the coming invasion of the Babylonians and, uh, uh, and the destruction of Jerusalem and, and the temple. And so there we have a, a situation where there was a, you might say, a small day of the Lord or a period of time in Judah's history that was called the day of the Lord. And it was a time of God's judgment in, a, in an extra strong way, in a powerful way in a direct way regarding his people there by the Babylonians. And you know, if you read in the Old Testament, you see where there were nations used, like the Babylonians, as instruments of God's wrath or instruments of God's judgment and um, you know, to carry out his will against another group of people. And uh, you know, later on, we see the Medes and the Persians were used by God to deal with the Babylonians and uh, you know, to carry out his purposes there. For that group of people because of their pride and um, in many other prophecies given the day of the Lord is still waiting to be fulfilled at some point in the future beyond the church age and I call it the final day of the Lord I don't know whether that's correct terminology or not but that's what I call the, what lies out ahead at the end it says the final day of the Lord will begin at the onset of the seven year tribulation period will extend through the millennial kingdom and will conclude with a great white throne judgment. So there we have a period we know of at least a thousand and seven years that will make up this final, what I call the final day of the Lord. And uh, you know, we'll see when you, when you study the tribulation period and all that goes on there, you, know, you see God uh, come, come into clean house. You know, he's he's <laughs> taking care of everything that's contrary to him. And then during the millennial reign, Christ himself is here on earth. And, and you know, so he is ruling and, and reigning in a, in a direct manner, you know, personally in the affairs of this world. Israel's going to be exalted. And the nations that's talked about will flow into Jerusalem to worship him as, as God and king. And so, and then of course the great white throne judgments where, you know, everything, is, you know, the, the lost are judged and sentenced to an eternity apart from God. And so all that is included in the final day of the Lord, at least that's my view. The series of events that comprise the final day of the Lord will be the final steps taken by God in cleaning up and restoring His creation to Himself. Remember when we studied 1 Corinthians in chapter 15, and we, we talked about that, and I think that uh, you know, when Christ came as a baby, he came, I think that's when, he, when God started the process to, to bring this creation back to himself. You know, he came, you know, he lived, he, he died to redeem mankind from their sin. And, and you know, he overcame sin and death and the grave at that point. And so, you know, the victory, victory was won. And when you read in, in 1 Corinthians 15, the, the chapter on the resurrection, uh, says, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he hath put down all rule and all authority and power. And he there is referred to Christ. For he must reign till he hath put, down, put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. The first he there is, is God the Father. In other words, remember when Christ said, All authority has been given unto me? You know, the Father delegated that authority to him. And that's what this verse is, is saying. For he hath put all things under his feet. His feet referring to Christ's feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. In other words, Christ is, is still submissive to his Father. You know, he's, he's um, under his Father. 
And when all things shall be subdued unto him, referring Christ, then shall the Son also himself be subject to him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. So the process right now is underway. You know, all that's going on in the world now, I think, is part of God working out his plan to bring it all back to himself. And all that wants to be contrary to him and all that wants to be rebellious to him and, and reject him, you know, he's going to deal with that. It's going to be cast into the lake of fire forever out of his presence. And then the rest of it will be allowed to enter into the eternal state and with him forever. And so I think this final day of the Lord is, you know, that you might say the concluding process to that and the culmination of that. And um, here's a quote from another Bible scholar, J.A. Moyer. says, The Old Testament came to use the idea of the day of the Lord as shorthand for the belief that history is heading towards a goal. You know, God is working out his plan. From our perspective, it resembles a mountaineer making for a great peak, but compelled by the train to climb other summits en route. And, uh, you know, I haven't done much mountain climbing, but you read about them, and, you know, to get to Mount Everest, you've got to make some travel over some other things to get there first. And uh, yet the interim climbs are not without purpose. Each is a further guarantee that presently the final peak will be reached. And so you look at what God did with uh, the Israelites when the Babylonians came in and conquered them. You know, there's a day, of, a day of the Lord there. You know, it's a short one. God judging Edom and Obadiah. That's a day of the Lord. And it's God is what he's doing there. And it's all part of God working out his plan and, and going to bring it to its conclusion. And... Um, so Old Testament history proceeds in, in a series of promises and fulfillments. But as the Old Testament history progressed in this way, hope was mingled with disappointment as covenant persons fell short of the promised deal, ideal. But it was a theocratic hope, so that well before the time of Amos, it had been crystallized into the expectation of a climactic day of Yahweh, in and by which all would be consummated. Of course, this guy I was reading, you know, regarding the prophecy of Amos, and he was writing about Amos. But what he's saying is all these other events that takes place are leading up to the final big event, you might say, that will be the consummation of all God is doing to bring and restore everything back to himself. And so I thought it was an interesting quote. And... Um, the Old Testament prophets use a variety of terms to describe the day of the Lord. Some of the terms most commonly used are, and we'll work through these real quick. I don't really get through all of it here, but things when you read certain prophecies you'll see. The day of the Lord is noted for seismic disturbances. You know, the sun and the moon and stars will not provide the light they normally do. You know, the heavens will shake and the earth will be shaken about in its orbit in Isaiah 13, 13. And so, uh, you know, it's going to be a disturbing time when it all really gets going. Other phrases associated with the day of the Lord are the day of darkness and gloominess. And that word uh, gloominess, a phalaw, means duskiness and twilight. and includes the idea that something ominous is about to happen. I thought about this. <laughs> you ever... And I was a Peanuts cartoon or something other, but always the opening line of a story. You know, it was a dark and stormy night, <laughs> and the clouds were hanging low, and and lightning was in the distance, and the thunder was in the distance, and the wind was shaking the trees, and in the distance you heard a dog bark, and over here was an owl screeching in the woods, and and so the tone was being set, saying something bad is going to happen. <laughs> You know, and that's kind of the idea behind this term here, gloominess. You know, it's, it, it's not looking good, and uh, something bad's on the way. And um, the day of clouds and thick darkness, and used by some of the prophets as well. The words clouds and darkness are often associated with times when the Lord appears or is present. And so you can see those scriptures there. And so it kind of supports the idea that, you know, God is going to be present or he's going to be working in a, in a powerful and, and a way, in a way that will get the attention of people. So there will be wonders, mo faith, and means something very visible, something miraculous, a sign which points towards something else. So there will be wonders during the day of the Lord. 
We talked about this some too when we studied through Corinthians and the idea behind the, the phrase signs and wonders. You know, those things happened. The Lord, you know, did various miracles and, and signs and wonders. But the reason they were done was to point towards who he was and what he was about. You know, the apostles did signs and wonders to confirm the fact that they were God's spokesman. They represented Christ. And so the sign themselves is not as important as what they pointed to or what they uh, referenced and wanted to get people to look to. Uh, it's kind of like driving down the road and all of a sudden you see the blinking yellow lights. And you get so mesmerized with the yellow lights that you don't read the sign. It says the bridge is out. <laughs> you keep looking at the yellow lights, what you're going to do? Drive off over into the, over into the hole. And so you, you, know, you, you have to think about signs and wonders in the right way in the right perspective you know that they're pointing towards something else that's more important and uh, you know god does miracles today you know every person who's born again is a miracle Amen. and and you know those type of things but you know and there'll come a time again when when you, the uh, prophet joel's prophecy you know when israel is is you know brought back to god you know the spirit of god is going to be poured out on that group of people and there will be signs and wonders done and things done ahead of and part of the day of the Lord, as we read here. The signs that will be displayed will point to the fact that a holy and righteous and omnipotent and omniscient and, of, and offended God is pouring out His wrath on sinful mankind. The signs were and will be given to draw people's attention to what God is doing. You know, it's another way of saying God saying, wake up and, and you know, here's what's about to happen. And, you know, uh, sometimes we get pretty dull and it takes a little bit of a wrap to get us woke up. And so um, there's going to be some pretty significant things that takes place during that time. The day of the Lord is described by phrases such as destruction from the Almighty. And here's something that scholars kind of made a play on words about. The word destruction is showed and it means to make desolate or to make waste of something or to ruin. And the word uh, Almighty, uh, Shaddai, is, comes from that base word. And, and from a base word meaning to be powerful or having the ability to spoil or ruin or destroy without being hindered. And so God being Almighty can do whatever He wants to do. And, and you know, and that can be blessing and, and restoration or it can be destruction. And uh, some references there. It says, in Isaiah 39, it states that in addition to the desolation and destruction created, the day of Lord will be cruel and um, due to the display of God's wrath and fierce anger. The word cruel there is a word that means to be terrible or cruel in the sense that God's mercy will not be present. That means it's going to be pretty bad. If God's mercy is not present, if God's grace is not present, then it's going to be bad. And, and um, you think about a cruel person. That's someone who doesn't extend any favors to anybody. In other words, they, they actually feel malicious probably a lot of times. And so there's no mercy given, no mercy shown when the opportunity is. And so the day of the Lord will be a cruel time for those who are uh, being judged. And so some pretty hard terms and pretty strong things said here about the day of the Lord. In this case, the day of salvation has passed, during which the Lord's grace and mercy were openly offered to all who re repent and believe. It will be a day of trouble and distress, Zephaniah says. The prophet Malachi referred to the day of the Lord as a great and dreadful time. And thankfully, if you're a believer in Christ, you know, we won't have to be a part of that. You know, we're going to be raptured out of here and before all that stuff breaks loose on the earth and, and we, can, we can rejoice in that and, and be thankful for that. We're out of time, so we'll pick up right there at this point next time.